who is the Shadow Rapporteur on the Social Climate Fund. Thank you very okay. much, Keith, and thank you for this uh, debate and for these very interesting uh, studies. Um, we are in a very difficult position right now. We're in this uh, current fossil fuel uh, crisis, uh, price crisis. Uh, the vulnerable people are receiving bills higher than their wages. And uh, we are paying them not only as taxpayers, but also uh, not only as consumers, but also as taxpayers through government subsidies from the ETS revenues, uh, which really finance the windfall profits of uh, fossil fuel companies. And of course, like Peter Lisa said, Putin's uh, war, war machine. So uh, this is a real problem here. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, we do give uh, to the citizens the signal, the clear signal that they are not going to be asked to shoulder the burden of the green transition. Otherwise, we will risk having, a, we, otherwise the yellow vests will, will be no more yellow, neither vests. They will be, they will be uh, black or brown shirts. So this is not, not only an issue of social cohesion, this is also an issue of democratic resilience. And I'm sure that this is surely a calculation at, in Putin's mind, if somebody can get into that mind. So for us, uh, the Social Climate Fund is uh, really the keystone of the puzzle, because you explained very well that there's a lot of, uh, that we have 13 uh, legislative pieces, which should amount to, to at least 55%, which of course should be higher. Um, so we can have give and takes between them, but the Social Climate Fund is a very welcome this, uh, departure from the market purist approach. We do not believe that the Green Deal is a techno-economic fix. We believe it's a political choice for just transition for all, for climate justice, for carbon equity, and for systemic change. This is not about compensation. This is not about arms. And I'm very happy to hear that Peter, I know Peter agrees with me anyway, but this is not about compensation. The green deal, the green transition is also about reducing inequalities, the inequalities inherent, baked in this uh, uh, carbon economy, this extractive economy. So if we're looking for system change, the Social Climate Fund is the place to do it. We do not, uh, we are not, we are agnostic on the architecture of the ETS. We know that the ETS has worked. We understand that there needs to be uh, ways to reduce uh, um, uh, to reduce uh, emissions from transportation and housing. But we have to face the fact that we see in your report as well, that this needs to be redistributive and progressive. It is not the poorest, in, the poorest households that have emissions really. In fact, uh, we have seen other studies that uh, the poorest 1% might as well, or the poorest 10% actually, should as well increase their emissions to, to reach uh, a livable level. Uh, it is the top 10% that needs to reduce emissions, and uh, that needs to be uh, to be uh, to be to be uh, addressed, uh, because it's not only the fixed price of CO2 that's a problem, which is completely absurd that the, the price of carbon would be going up, but the price for the social climate fund would be remaining the same. Uh, it is also that the carbon price should be higher above a certain uh, consumption level that is. Paris align. If we have national carbon budget, then we should have per capita budget to achieve a sort of uh, carbon equity. So um, uh, this is, of course, has to do with the member states as well. And that was shown in the second uh, study about the purchase parity. And as long as we do not have an energy union where the price of CO2, either in, in gas, oil, or, uh, or coal is the same, it's very different. In, uh, in Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, than it is in Germany. So this needs to be uh, addressed as well. And um, finally, on the definition of energy poverty, which at least is, is in a very, it's a very welcome and timely and long due need to have a pan-European definition of energy poverty. Uh, we are missing a little bit uh, the part on the cooling, on the cooling, because cooling in Southern Europe, which expect, which we expect to desertify, and we expect to have longer extreme heat events, which are going to be life-threatening. Cooling is an adaptation technique; it's a resilience requirement. Um, so it's not only about uh, uh, you know the lifestyle; it's about living. 
Uh, so uh, this is something we need to see the energy poverty definition. Uh, so um, finally, on the um, two points finally, on the social climate plans, they need to be strengthened because we understand that the vulnerable communities uh, are going to need to be organized in the local level. And we have seen in the RRF and in the Just Transition Plan that the public consultation was problematic. It was not transparent and it was not easy for the most vulnerable people to participate. So this needs to change in the social climate on the social climate plan. Finally, and finally, really, um, uh, on the direct income and on the, uh, uh, on the investment side, it is clear to everybody and we really applaud that we want to be constructive in this transition period of compensation in the early stage. But we have to understand that the point here is to have structural investments to allow for the most vulnerable communities to have access to good and healthy homes, uh, to public uh, clean transportation and to clean energy. This is not about Teslas. It's about public buses that run on clean energy. It's about the access of the, of the, of the poorest, which we need to get on board if we are going to achieve this transition. This is going to be bloody hard, like Timmerman said, and it's not gonna work if it's not just, and it needs to be seen to be just and understood to be just. And the Social Climate Fund is our one and only instrument, the Fit for 55 package that we have the opportunity to do it. So we should not lose it. Thank you.